Next, we have Peter Crane. Um, Peter will talk about evolution and agriculture. Peter is an alumnus of the University of Reading. He's formerly director of the Royal Botanical Gardens in Kew in London. He's a man who moves, and um, he left Kew in 2006 to take up a faculty appointment at the University of Chicago, Department of Geophysical Sciences, where I think he'd previously held a faculty position. In September, he will move again from Chicago to become the new dean of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental uh, Studies. Um, he is uh, a fellow of the Royal Society of the National Academy, but more importantly, this university, um, a few weeks ago, uh, conferred an honorary degree on Peter Crane, so he was here quite recently, dressed quite differently from the way uh, he now looks, um, and I hope he enjoyed that experience. His research interests involved the uh, integration of studies of living and fossil plants in order to understand large-scale patterns and processes in plant evolution. Peter. Jean, thanks very much. Um, the probability of me getting red carded for this presentation is really very high. I think I have about um, way too many slides, and so I'm, I'm going to restrain myself and go a little more slowly. I really only have one point to make, and that's really the point that's on this, on this slide. And, um, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about people, uh, and surely Darwin worked on people. Um, but uh, I'd just like to interject into this discussion uh, that how we interact with the rest of the biology on this planet uh, makes a very big difference. Uh, makes a real, really big difference to them, but I think it also makes uh, a big difference uh, to us. And the world is changing very rapidly uh, before our very eyes. So here are three generations of my, my own family against the rise in human population, and that's one aspect of the change. Another aspect of the change, post-Darwin, we just talked, heard from Chris, things that Darwin might be surprised about, I think he wouldn't recognize uh, this world. That's the change in Chicago over the last century. This is from the paper in Science by Peter Kariva, The Human Footprint on the Earth and the human footprint in a sense in the oceans. A little bit slow, this projector, but there we go. The next one, as you've already seen, is Rachel Carson. And um, uh, I mean, obviously, Rachel Carson made very important points about uh, the consequences of using those particular synthetic pesticides, but she also made the point that in a very short time they became very widely distributed around the planet. So the, the central point, I think, is that there's really nowhere uh, on this planet that's not been impacted by human activity. Try again. Uh, we've changed in uh, really unbelievable ways. Uh, not only our climate, but biogeochemical cycles. And um, we've moved plants and animals around in ways that uh, uh, were already happening, by the way, in Darwin's time, but at a scale now that is almost so vast to comprehend. Those of you that have been walking around Cambridge this week uh, have undoubtedly seen uh, this leaf miner on the um, uh, horse chestnuts uh, growing along the, the backs. Uh, this particular leaf miner only appeared in the UK uh, in this century, in the 21st century, spreading uh, rapidly. It's just one example of the many changes. In terms of climate, these are the uh, changes in the US hardiness zones, the zones by which you can predict where you can grow uh, the plants in your garden, and uh, the warm warmth is spreading uh, northwards. Um, we don't really have an intergovernmental panel on climate change body for uh, the rest of biology. The closest thing we came to it was the production of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment back in uh, 2005, and discussions are going on right now as to how that work should be 
uh, taken forward. But I just show you their, their kind of main uh, conclusions, um, which are balanced. Over the last 50 years, humans have changed ecosystems more rapidly and more extensively than at any time in human history, largely to meet rapidly growing demands for food, fresh water, timber, fiber, and fuel. Those changes have resulted to substantial and largely irreversible loss in the diversity of life on Earth. But on the other hand, they've also contributed to substantial net gains in human well-being and econ economic development. But those gains have been achieved at a growing cost in the form of degradation of many ecosystem services, increased list risk of nonlinear changes, and exacerbation of poverty for some people. And these problems, unless they're addressed, will substantially diminish the benefits that future generations obtain from ecosystems. And the final point about the Millennium Development Goals. I think I'm approaching the end of my eight minutes, so I just want to uh, say a little bit about um, what all this means for, for evolution. We can see evolution happening in front of our eyes, and with the technology and the techniques now available that, that the other panelists have uh, described, we don't have to wait until that change uh, is so obvious and so visible that we can do something about it. We can use that technology to see these things uh, coming. We don't want to know when species go extinct. We do want to know when populations are in decline. And we can uh, use these modern techniques in this way. The changes that we've wrought, to come back to Harold Varmus's points at the beginning of his talk, we know it's all about variation and it's about selection and the changes that we've wrought have dramatically changed the nature of selection to which all of the organisms on the planet are subject to. Uh, and with the advent of these new methods, we can uh, follow them. Just to give you a, a, one example, uh, the floor of the British Isles contains roughly 3,000 species. Half of those are native. Um, the other half have been introduced at various times over the course of human history. Those introduced species now hybridize with each other, and they hybridize with the uh, native species. They're, they're changing. Those populations are changing. In the US, the introduction of uh, the narrow-leaf cattail has hybridized with the native cattail to produce a new and aggressive hybrid that's now taking over the westland, wetlands of the US, spreading uh, west from the uh, east coast. In the UK, Rhododendron ponticum, which has become naturalized uh, in this country, has introgressed and picked up some genes from Rhododendron cotorbiense, not a species that's escaped from cultivation, but a species that's in cultivation. And the evidence indicates that the genes it's picked up has given it increased cold tolerance, and we now see Rhododendron ponticum spreading ar across the west of England in uh, Western Ireland, Northwest Scotland, uh, and so on. So for me, uh, a very important part of uh, evolutionary biology uh, in the future is figuring out how to uh, manage our environment. Ed Wilson says that um, uh, these systems are too complicated to manage uh, like a garden. Um, I have a huge amount of sympathy with that statement. Uh, but it's also true that we don't have any choice. Um, the discussions, the decisions that we make uh, are going to be crucially important for managing our environment. They'll need to be informed by our understanding of evolutionary biology. And if you come back to that last page uh, of the origin where Darwin speaks about the, the tangled bank and the beauty and the intricacy of those uh, interactions, and then he finishes with this phrase, there is grandeur in this view of life and I think it's up to us to ensure or to decide whether there will continue to be grandeur in the life that we leave to future generations. Thank you very much.